stress a rock, it acts like a, conduct, a semiconductor and the stressing a rock in one place can end up in charge transfer to the other end of uh, the rock, you know, some metres away. Mm. Uh, underground, that, can, that transfer can operate over vast distances with the result that uh, you will get strange phenomena uh, associated with the earthquake, both before, during and after. And one of the strange things uh, is a build-up of charge in the ionosphere. Uh, in other words, it's acting like a giant capacitor. So there are means, I think, of um, predicting earthquakes, and it involves looking at the electrical nature of the Earth and the, its environment and noting that when the stresses build up. Uh, it, it explains all kinds of things like earthquake lights and... Uh, uh, plasma effects, uh, atmospheric effects, and as I said, ionospheric uh, charge buildup. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, that when uh, the discharge takes place slowly, you uh, have a volcano, and the lightning discharges in volcanoes is phenomenal. Yes. Um, but that's, once again, a, a means of transferring charge between the Earth and uh, space. So w could there be other effects from from this as well, I mean, we, we've been, if you will, in in a period of of uh, uh, a lot of earthquakes now, and and a lot of well, actually, other weird effects. Uh, I, I guess you're familiar with what has been dubbed the the, the Norway spiral, for instance, uh, which looked <coughs> to me, in some way, as a kind of a, a some kind of plasma phenomena. In one way, there's been speculations that uh, other human facilities has been involved, such as. Harp and IceCat and other atmospheric heating uh, programs that, that uh, various mm. research groups are, are, are running to try to create patterns in, in the in the sky and so forth. But 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 from your point of view, if you have heard about this and want to uh, talk about it, could it be an, a natural phenomena that, that has been taking place in some way in terms of these weird shapes <laughs> showing up in the in the sky? What do you think, Wolf? Mm -hmm. uh, well, my impression of that was that um, it uh, wasn't a natural phenomenon. Uh, that it was, um, uh, the explanation was that it was a rocket uh, that had uh, misfired in some way. Mm. And I can imagine a spiralling rocket uh, exhaust uh, creating uh, a pattern similar to that. It's, I can't imagine a plasma discharge uh, creating that um, that kind of pattern in the sky. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh the plasma discharge uh, has other features which weren't there. Um, so my, my uh, feeling is that it was a... It, the, the rocket explanation is probably correct in that case. Oh, really? Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm. Um, so, uh, okay, so we, we covered a little bit in terms of earthquakes and things that are uh, happening here on Earth as well, but I do want to get into here in our, in our last uh, 10 or so minutes that we have, Wall, about something that you mentioned uh, in in the break between our, our two segments here in terms of both time travel and, and the and the search, as it were, for, uh, for for E.T. In whatever end you, you want to begin, maybe we can talk <laughs> about time travel first. I mean, that's a fascinating uh, subject and theory in itself. And, and I guess, that, Dan, that this also takes... Um, a, a connection, or it has a relationship rather with, with the, the with the uh, uh, with the electrical point of view here, obviously, and, yes. and, and dovetails with maybe some of the things that Tesla was working on, and, and this instantaneous communications that you that you mentioned before. But, but please tell tell yeah. us about time travel from your point of view, then. Well, as soon as you have um, near instantaneous communication, then you get away from this problem uh, that Einstein introduced, and it's a non-problem actually of uh, perspective, uh, both in time and space. And in fact, the idea of uh, space and time being connected in some way and, uh, as a fourth dimension is absolute nonsense. Uh, there are only three dimensions um, and because a dimension is something you can measure with a ruler. And as somebody, uh, some wag once said, uh, point me in the direction of time. <laughs> <laughs> so a dimension has both uh, direction and uh, it's measurable in terms of um, its length. Uh, you don't measure time as a length. It, in fact, time isn't something that you, an object that you can fiddle with and stretch or compress. Uh, it is, in my opinion, there is a universal clock ticking and there's no way that time travel can occur. 
uh, and common sense suggests this is correct too. Uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, conundrums that arise if you try and uh, invoke time travel. Um, so, yeah, time travel, I'm afraid, even though I'm a Doctor Who fan, or I was <laughs> the, uh, the, the early ones at least, um, it, it's great fun. And uh, But it's out it's the door? A, it's out the door, I'm afraid. Yep. The, oh, okay. Well, there you yeah. go then. How, how about yep. E.T. then? We talked about SETI before and, and, uh, and things yes. like this uh, in terms of finding things with the uh, – Radio communication, but there, as, as we alluded to, there must be some better way. And if there is indeed a sentient life out there that are more intelligent than us, they would yeah. use a different set of communication uh, systems, right? That's right, yes. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, uh, the universe uh, communicates uh, via this longitudinal electric force of near infinite speed, uh, ponderable objects like uh, stars and planets and so on do so using the uh, dipolar electric force of gravity and uh, the um, anyone who wanted to communicate uh, with another uh, sentient being at any distance in space would not want to have to wait for light to travel you know for several years in one direction and then uh, the reply come take the same amount of time to come back again. I mean, you just can't hold a conversation that way. However, when we figure out how to communicate the way biological systems seem to communicate, and that is near instantaneously via this uh, longitudinal electric force, and I, I'm, I feel sure we'll figure that one out, um, then this communication would operate just as easily as it does between you and I right now. Hmm. And that makes much more sense. However, there is a problem. We haven't uh, found any signals from space that look like intelligence in the electromagnetic spectrum, and I don't expect we ever will. Uh, but if we turned our attention to this longitudinal form of communication, uh, the question is, would we be able to pick up signals? And uh, there is this problem. In my view, the most hospitable place for the formation of life and uh, or the nurturing of life, because I think life is one of the uh, intelligent features of the universe, mm -hmm. which will try and exist wherever it finds a suitable environment. Yes. Those suitable environments exist within the plasma sheath of brown dwarf stars or you know, very low, uh, very dim stars. When the power is turned down on a star, the photosphere winks out. In other words, you no longer get that bright display. But what you do get is the glow, like a neon glow, and that is very extensive and it extends uh, quite some distance from the central object. Under those conditions, any satellites of that uh, brown dwarf can orbit quite comfortably inside this red glow. And this is apparently the environment that the Earth was in before we um, uh, encountered the sun. Uh, Proto-Saturn was our, our, our sun at the time. We orbited it uh, fairly closely along with uh, Mars and many other objects, including Titan, which is one of the family. Mm -hmm. And um, inside that cocoon of uh, dim red radiation, there are no seasons. Every part of every body inside that cocoon receives the same amount of energy per square metre, regardless of whether it's the pole, the equator, or any other latitude. It doesn't matter what the axial tilt is, whether the, the um, uh, planet or moon spins or not. Mm. Uh, it will receive the same amount of radiation everywhere. And the evidence that uh, the Earth was in this environment, of course, is uh, the coal beds in the Antarctica and so on. In other words, there was a period in the Earth's not-so-ancient history when uh, the growth of vegetation was very lush and it was uh, global. Um we had uh, kind of tropical forests in Antarctica. And um, also the other thing was that in that electrical environment, the Earth's gravity was much less, so that uh, a huge animal...